Welcome to another video by Pharos Leadership. Today we want to talk about the theory of constraints. So I want to pose the question, which is more profitable, a factory that uses all their machines 100% of the time, or the factory that has them sitting idle? The answer may paradoxically be the factory with idle machines. Nearly 40 years ago, Dr. Eli Goldratt explained this strange phenomenon in his book called The Goal. In that book, he introduced the theory of constraints, which teaches us how to improve a manufacturing process. In the aerospace industry, for example, hundreds of manufacturers are involved in creating every part of the final airplane. A single plane may take months to build. As you can imagine, it's a very complex project. Where would you even begin to improve it? In The Goal, Dr. Goldrack tells us a fictional tale of a manager trying to bring his factory back from the brink of bankruptcy. Products are chronically late, inventory and in-process work is piling up everywhere, while at the same time he is told his machines are working at peak efficiency, logging more productive hours than ever before. As the manager learns about the theory of constraints and applies its lessons, he discovers a better way of doing business. So, what is this theory of constraints? Well, the theory of constraints asks us to maximize our goal not our efficiencies. As Goldratt's book points out, our goal is profit. So we systematically find and eliminate constraints within our system that prevent us from having greater profit. The theory is guided by five focusing steps, as they're called in the book. First, identify the first system constraint. In a factory, that's the manufacturing stage that is the slowest, most bogged down, or the least productive. Second, exploit the constraint. This means making sure that the constraint is completely utilized. Third, subordinate everything to the constraint. Ensure that the rest of the process supports and fully utilizes the constraint to its fullest. Fourth, then elevate the constraint. Only at this step do you actually increase the capacity of the constraint. Finally, avoid inertia. These steps often create a lot of excess in the rest of the system. Avoid the inertia that makes people think they've all of a sudden become more productive. Instead, go back to step one and find the next constraint. So let's use an example. This diagram is of a widget factory. We'll assume that the factory is open 10 hours a day from 7 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon. At the end of the day, a truck comes to pick up the completed widgets. All the widgets are sold. Marketing can sell a total of 600 widgets per day. Okay, so step one is to identify our first constraint. We see we have three machines in this factory, a bit machine, a bob machine, and a widget machine. The bit machine makes 600 bits per hour. The bob machine makes a thousand bobs per hour, more than what we need. The widget machine uses 30 bits and 30 bobs per hour. The output, of course, would then be 30 widgets per hour. However, right now the factory is creating around 180 widgets per day, when you would expect 300, so it's far below expectations. It looks like the widget machine is the slowest step in the process. So let's call it our first constraint. Step two is to exploit the constraint. Widget machine has only 60% uptime. When we look at the service log, we find that the widget machine has an incredible 12 days of downtime last month. By adding one hour daily maintenance in the morning before work starts, we can avoid long downtimes and improve the machine from 60% uptime to 100% uptime. Well, success, right? With this new maintenance schedule, the factory is now producing, oops, 200 widgets per day. Well, apparently there are more issues to solve. Step three is to subordinate the system to that constraint. In our case, we wanna make sure that the rest of the factory keeps that machine working as much as possible. Well, let's look at the storage space for the factory. We have storage space for our bits and our widgets. The bits have storage space for up to 10 hours or one full day of work. Bobs are small, so their storage is minimal. 
but the widget machine only has storage for up to 200 widgets, meaning that while the machine can produce 300, it stops when the storage is full. Since the truck only comes once a day, that space fills up before the end of the day. We can shift some of the storage space from the bit machine, which used to need a lot of space while the widget machine was out of service, to the widget machine. Now the widget machine can work all day without running out of storage space. Now let's look at our output. 300 widgets per day. Excellent. That's what we originally thought we could produce. But can we do better? The widget machine is now working at full capacity. It is still our constraint because the bit machine can supply 600 bits per day. And remember, we can sell up to 600 widgets per day. So step four is to elevate the constraint. We increase our capacity by purchasing a second widget machine. The combined output of these machines is now 60 widgets per hour. This is in general the theory of constraints. We are identified our first constraint, the widget machine. We exploited it by making sure it ran 100% of the time. We subordinated the rest of the factory by moving storage where it was needed. We elevated the process by purchasing a second machine. Finally, what we want to do is avoid inertia. We could continue to improve this system, but just blindly increasing the output of all systems isn't necessarily an improvement. Avoiding inertia is recognizing that while improving uptime on the widget machine, we may have improved the factory, there still may be inefficiencies elsewhere. Maybe we start borrowing from bit storage to make up for short overages in those other areas. This would cause delays in bit production. A cascade of problems could follow with delayed widget production because the bits were not keeping up with the widget machine running full time. Then a misguided employee could see that, hey, there's extra space there and could commandeer that space for storage of other items. Instead, we stop and reevaluate. Go back to step one and find our new constraint. While the bits and widgets production is well balanced, we may be limited by widget storage and need to resolve that before increasing production. So Dr. Goldratt introduced us to the theory of constraints back in the 1980s, but its lessons are still valuable today in manufacturing and in other industries. Soon we're going to put out a video covering the landmark book titled The Phoenix Project, which covers many of these same concepts, but in a software development environment. Appreciate you watching, and I hope to see you again. Thanks. If you enjoyed the content that you saw today and would like to help me grow the channel, hover your mouse over my picture to the left and click on subscribe. There are also other videos showing on the screen that you might enjoy.